lecture. Okay, today we're we'll talking about chapter six: cash fraud and internal controls. Okay, and again, first thing we talk about is what's internal control. It defines purposes and principles. Remember, the whole point of internal control is it's all the company's policies and procedures, what they have in place. Again, why do they have all these policies and procedures in place? Because again, it's to protect the company, protect their assets, make sure accounting is reliable, so they can make decisions based on it. Make sure people even follow policies. Now remember, if people follow policies, operations should be efficiently done. Okay, make sure things flow efficiently, effectively. Now, in the early 2000s, after Enron and WorldCom, there was a lot of fraud. So the government stepped in and said, okay, for all publicly traded companies, they passed what's called the SOX Act, Sarbanes and Oxley Act. And now, companies, you know, the managers and auditors of a publicly traded company, they have to document, certify their internal controls. So, okay, what are you doing? You know, what policy was used to have in place to protect your assets, to help to reduce and prevent fraud? And they have to talk about the effectiveness. Is it working? Is it not working? What happened? What are you doing every day to ensure fraud isn't occurring? That's one of the key principles about internal control. You know, internal control, again, yeah, every company has different levels of internal control and you know, how it all works. But in the meantime, these are some of the basic internal controls that every company has. You know, make sure everyone knows their responsibilities, you know, have the proper documentation, records, you know, perform reviews periodically. Again, every company is different in internal controls, but these are some of the basic guidelines every company should have. Again, technology and fraud. Remember, technology is good and bad. It's helped open up new businesses, made you know, transactions faster. You know, there's also some drawbacks to it. Now there's more fraud. There's more opportunities for people to commit fraud. Those things you got to consider as you, you know, we mix technology and business. Now remember, fraud, the key thing about fraud is the difference between fraud and error. Fraud you were acting with intent. It means you knew what you were doing. I mean, I was stealing on purpose for my own personal gain. A mistake was you did it unintentionally. You know, you keyed in the wrong number. That's, you know, it happens sometimes. It's not because you did it on purpose, not because you're trying to have a personal gain. And remember, with fraud to happen, you got to have three things. The most important thing at the very top is you got to have opportunity. Say, yes, I'm around cash. Yes, I can steal. Okay. You know, then you have any financial pressure. You have a lot of debt. Last one's you rationalize. Say, yes, I stole, except I stole $1,000 from Walmart. They're not going to miss it. And of course, you know, the cost to internal control, and obviously the benefits. Tax there, I mean, every company has some internal controls. You know, if you're a small store, a mom pop store, you don't need a state of the art, top of the line security systems. You, know, you may be small, maybe you're independent. You now you're different from a company like, say, like Walmart or Target. Again, some different things here. I talked about internal control purposes, some of the principles. Again, the thing the most stolen, the most you know, subject to fraud would be cash. It's about cash and cash equivalents. Remember, cash is, you know, all your not just your paper bills and coins, everything. Well, how much do you have in your bank accounts, savings account, checking account, money market accounts. And again, to make sure cash is done effectively and efficiently, you gotta make sure you follow three things here. You gotta make sure it's kept separate. You know, who handles the cash from the record keep it? Evidence made by check, so you have a documentation, you can trail it. And of course, if you're in cash receipt, especially large cash sums, make sure you deposit in the bank, you know, swiftly. Don't let it sit there the, in the vault or even the company for a few days. Your right, cash, of course, we just talked about what cash is. You can also have what's called a cash equivalent. It means it's not technically cash, but in the meantime, it's just as good as cash. And again, to be considered, you know, it could be such as, you know, it's a short-term liquid investment. It means in the next month, you three months or less, you can convert to cash. It could be even, like, say, a bond or a stock. They're going to cash in, like, say, next week or next month. Again, how do we effectively manage cash? Again, you always want to make sure, I mean, obviously, you don't want to have zero cash, except you want to make sure just about the minimum level to operate. Again, not too much, but not too little either. And, of course, you know, manage your cash effectively. You know, obviously, pay your bills on time. Encourage, you know, if you're doing receivables, make sure you receive payment. Invest in the excess cash you might have. Plan your... Big cash purposes, you know, effectively. Again here, you know, the counter receipts. Well, you know, you got to make sure not only do they charge the right amount, do they receive the right amount. That's the whole point here. You know, no one can make a mistake or divert cash. And even if it's by accident, you got to figure out why was there an accident made? Why did someone make an error? 
Again here, it shows your register tape says you should have $550, but you have $555. Again, it could be due to error, maybe someone you know, left money behind, for whatever reason here. So now it says you have $5 extra. It's going to go to cash over and short. And we always want to debit cash to increase it by the actual amount. And you want to credit sales by the actual amount because those are the actual amounts. Now to the opposite. You should have $625, now you're short $4. Okay, again here, you want to debit $4 here, and then again, again, as we talked about earlier. Increase cash by the actual cash amount. Increase sales by the actual sales. And again, any cash used by mail, make sure, again, if you see money by mail, it has to be kept a check or money order. Make sure someone, you know, whoever opens it, you know, it's properly verified and deposit straight to the bank. And disbursements. Remember now, again, if you want to get paid by the company for whatever reason, first of all, always make it by check to have documentation. Sometimes you may have to get one or two signatures on the checks. And again, to receive payment, you have to follow a voucher system. It says, okay, make sure do you have the proper verification. You have to get a manager signature, have proper receipts. You know, first of all, is it an actual receipt? Make sure it's not fraudulent. Do you have a per diem? You, know, you can only spend hundred dollars a day. Anti voucher system. Yeah, it's talking about petty cash. I mean, petty cash is just for your small incidental expenses, your postage, court fees. Again, now we first establish it. You want debit petty cash to start it, you know, and of course credit cash to decrease it. So now it says here you have seventy-five dollars for incidental expenses, you know, postage, courier fees, and so on. Again, you want to keep itemization here. So okay, what'd you spend that petty cash on? You know, tile cleaning here, transportation, and so on. Now remember, you can only spend seventy-five dollars. Here you spent seventy-one dollars and thirty cents. Now you reimbursed it because remember you always want to reimburse it back to its actual amount. So now it says, all right, I want to put it back. To seventy-five dollars. Let's doubt each expense. Then you want to credit cash for how much all your expenses were. Again, let's say you want to increase it from seventy-five dollars to hundred dollars. Now, well, you want to debit it by the difference, or the opposite. You want to decrease and do the opposite. Debit cash, credit petty cash. You want to go from seventy-five dollars now to fifty-five dollars. And sometimes, even with you know, if there's a difference here, sometimes petty cash is going to be a difference for whatever reason. Okay, again here. Again, it goes back to our account that we talked about earlier. Cash over and short. Again here, give me some examples here. Now, if you notice here, it has to go back to 150. You've spent $131, except you only cap $120. So that difference goes to cash over and short by $11. Again, it should always be before and after reimbursement back to the original amount. In this case, was $150. Again, the last we talk about is bank services. Remember, people still use banks. It's probably the most safe and best place to store your money. Again, you want to view your bank statement. Usually, once a month, you get your bank statement. Show the activity in the account. What happened in that account? What's going on with the account? Okay, what you want to do is you want to prepare what's called a bank reconciliation. A bank reconciliation, you verify how much cash you have in your books to how much cash you have in the bank. Again, if there's any differences, sometimes it's due to timing differences, sometimes the bank might have some activity that didn't get recorded by the bank, or sometimes you made a you know deposit, showed up the next the following month's statement, or there's a fraud. Again, a deposit in transit means you made a deposit, but it hasn't cleared the bank yet. Remember, sometimes checks, you make a check, it takes two or three days. Same with that standing check. You know, I gave someone some money, it's not automatically. It might take two or three days to clear. Now on this side, the book side means that the bank has some activity that you didn't record. Did the bank make collection for you? You're any interest? Any uncollectible items? You know, NSFs, non sufficient funds. And again here, you add up all up here. Again, the most important thing is these two have to equal. There's no reason why they should not equal. Okay, again, follow the steps here. Now remember, everything on the book side, you have to make a journal entry for because it means it happened on the bank side, you haven't recorded your books yet. So everything you add to cash, you want debit cash. Everything you deduct from cash, you want a credit cash. Okay. And these will be your various entries, from collection fees to interest and so on. Give example one for Gucci.
Bye, class. Let me know if any of questions, okay? Thank you.